So let me talk about education. The idea of education, uh, you know, what we teach our children, how we teach them, and why we teach them, is evolving over generations. Uh, what uh, cavemen did and what we do today in education is very different. Now we are on the brink of a major transformation that is going to happen in the next few years in the education space. And I wanted to share some of the glimpses of that future of education with you all. So, you know, we are all products of uh, uh, an education system that came out at the time of Industrial Revolution, and it hasn't changed much. And we have poured billions of trillions of dollars into it. We have built thousands and millions of schools. We have trained uh, millions of teachers. And, uh, you know, billions of students have gone through that school system. And obviously it has served very well for our society, but uh, a lot of countries, a lot of education systems are going through a lot of soul searching right now in terms of is that the right education system that uh, we should have. So uh, if you think about it, billions of students have gone through our education system. How many geniuses like Ramanujam and Einstein has that school system produced? Isn't that a waste of a schooling system that is not producing geniuses and inventors and thinkers, and it is really producing what you would call test takers? And I'm going to use a very uh, harsh language to describe this because a lot of educators, a lot of teachers, a lot of students, and a lot of parents uh, have come to realize that our school system has become a factory for uh, skilled labor, if you will. Right? So the idea is uh, nobody studies for the joy of learning anymore. If you ask a kid, what are you learning? They will say, I'm preparing for IIT. I'm preparing for board exam. I'm preparing for uh, some other exam. Now, the good news is we are living in a very interesting time today. We have three things that are going on technologically that can fundamentally change the idea of education for the future. The first thing is the internet. Now, in the last so many years, we have seen how internet has become an integral part of life. Uh, it is the repository of all human knowledge, and it has really replaced the libraries that we used to go to. The second thing that is going on is the plethora of devices that we have access to today. We can access the internet through our mobile phone, through our tablets, through our TVs, through our laptops. The access to that much of knowledge and repository has become really cheap and, and possible for everyone. The third thing that is going on today is the birth of uh, artificial intelligence all over again. So the idea of AI started more than five decades ago, and today we are seeing a reincarnation of AI. Let's call it AI 2.0. And the real challenge that we want to address is, can AI actually mimic a great human teacher? Because ultimately the goal is that how do you take a great teacher and make it available to the billions of children out there? We are all here because there's a great teacher who has influenced our life, but we are the lucky ones. There are a lot of children out there who don't have access to a great teacher. They don't have a school. They don't have anybody who is educated enough in their village. How can we scale a great teacher to all the masses? Now, I'm going to focus on two key qualities of a great teacher and see how AI can actually mimic those qualities and then scale a great teacher across the planet. So the first quality that I think a great teacher has is that he makes us learn to think and not just learn to solve. And we're going to harp on this a little bit. And the idea is uh, it's not important whether we are studying math or science or chemistry or dancing. It's the idea that we are becoming better thinkers is more important than the subject that we are studying. And today, our schools are teaching us how to solve. This is how you solve this IIT problem. This is how you solve this physics problem. They're not teaching us how to think. So we're going to uh, investigate that a little bit. The second thing that a great teacher does is a teacher is a bridge between the student and the subject. We first like the teacher, then we like the subject. And this is true if you look at your own life. The reason you like a subject is because you like the first teacher who introduced that subject to you. So given that, can AI play these two roles? And if you could make AI do even 1% of this, and scale it to the planet through all the devices and the internet we talked about, I think we can make a major breakthrough in how education is done in the next century, next uh, couple of decades. So, uh, you know, one of the oldest dreams of AI was not just to build what we call teaching, thinking machines, machines that could, you know, play chess or, you know, 
understand images or understand speech, we've already done that. The next big challenge of AI is to build such a teaching machine so that it can scale to the planet and bring a great teacher to every student. Now, what does a teaching machine look like? It's going to need four broad things for us to do before we can claim that we have built a teaching machine. The first is, it should be able to understand the way humans understand. You know, we understand formulas, we understand text, we understand diagrams. Machines don't understand them yet, the way humans do. The next thing is, they should be able to think. That means they should be able to acquire knowledge, represent knowledge, and use knowledge at the right time. They should be able to learn from experience. We are not talking about humans. We are talking about machines who can do all these things. And they should be able to do reasoning and thinking the way humans do. And we'll talk about that too. The next thing a machine should be able to do is it should be able to personalize itself to the student, like a teacher does. And here, it should be able to assess, not test, not exam, not judge, but assess what the student is capable of at this stage. And therefore, how can I give him the next lesson which is just right for him at the right level of difficulty? And can I adopt that, adapt that uh, teaching as the student changes? And the fourth big area that a teaching machine should be good at is what we will call communication. Communication between a teacher and a student, can we do it through with a device? So if you look at conversations, conversation is the most common form of communication, and machines today are not able to have conversations. They're able to do search, they're able to answer questions, but they're not able to really have conversation. We have a long way to go there. Apart from that, can machines recognize gestures? When a student says this in front of a camera, can the machine say, no, he didn't get it? Teacher gets it. Teacher looks at the eyes of the student and he, he knows what's going on. Can machines do that? And finally, can machines understand emotions? Looking at your facial expression and the voice, can an iPad uh, look at that and say, oh, this guy's frustrated, I think he needs a break. Right? So how can we build a teaching machine? There's a lot, long way to go, but I think AI is at the brink of doing all these things. There are a lot of research going on in all these areas, and if we can put them all together, we can really scale a great teacher to everybody on the planet. So let me harp on two areas in this. One is the idea of thinking. So Einstein said that you know, education is not really about cramming facts and regurgitating. That is what a quiz master does. That is what a database system does. What humans are supposed to do is learn how to think. And what we do today with our education system, we do something like this. We claim that we are teaching great thinkers, but what we actually do is we throw a textbook in front of a student and we tell him, this is how you should solve this problem, this is how you should solve that problem. Now, the student is not interested in learning, he's interested in passing the test, so what is he going to do? He's going to learn the prescribed way of solving the problem. And right there, we have killed another thinker. So, how do we change this? So, let me uh, uh, talk about the idea of learning to think a little bit deeper. Uh, so, let me take the example of a tic-tac-toe game. Tic-tac-toe game is the favorite game of an AI researcher and that's why I want to use this. So in a tic-tac-toe game, uh, if I give you this board position and ask you what is the next board position you are going to use, uh, the first question you're going to ask me is, hey, what are my options? The idea that first you need to know your options. The keyword is know. Knowledge is really about knowing your options. So what knowledge does is knowledge enumerates all the options. No matter what situation we are, if I have more knowledge, I'll be able to do more uh, explorations. Uh, so let me give you an example of what this means in the math world, for example. So if I give you an expression to solve, and this expression is sitting in front of a student who doesn't like math, what is he going to do? Right? And the first thing that our brain does is it says, what are my options? And it looks at the knowledge and says, oh, I could do this, I could do this, I could do this. The idea of knowledge is to enumerate. And the more a child knows, the more options he can come up with. The second thing is, this knowledge doesn't tell me which is a better option. It only tells me these are the options. So now we need to go from knowledge to the next level, which I call learning. Now if I play the game again and again, if I succeed in, in some cases, if I fail in some cases, I am going to now learn that certain options are better than other options. And the same idea applies to uh, math also. In this case, if I have three options, I can tell 
that this option is going to be better than the other. So that is the idea of learning. Let me talk about another problem, which is uh, this idea of personalization and customer centricity. There was a big buzzword about customer centricity. And you know, if you look at how search engines have improved and how recommendation systems have improved, we have all become better because we have personalized them to the customer. Now, can't we do the same thing for our students? How, why should we have a one-size-fits-all system for all the students? Now, this is not something you could have imagined before the internet era. So obviously, we created that kind of education system, but today it is possible. And research shows that if you take a whole bunch of students, teach them the conventional way, you're going to get a certain uh, uh, quality of education. Now, if you force them to not go to the next concept, stay on that concept, make sure you understand it, and then go to the next concept, this is called mastery learning. If you do that, their performance will increase. Now, if you do that in a one-on-one -on -one mentorship way, imagine now a tutor sitting with every child and making sure that until that child understands that concept and he gives feedback, the child doesn't move forward. If you do it that way, then it's going to be even better. Now, this is a very classical study that makes the case for one-on-one -on -one tutoring. And that's why we all understand why having a tutor is a better idea than uh, going to a classroom filled with students. But the problem with this is, how would you scale this for the planet? Now, if an AI machine can actually do this, replace this human tutor with an app or some kind of a, a AI system, then it's going to be able to do this for every child on the planet. So if you think about personalization, there are many aspects to personalization. One is, how do you assess what the student knows, what he doesn't know, how well he knows it? What about the curriculum? If you know that this student knows certain things better than others, can you not have him learn something else and the other student learn something else? Can I create a different curriculum for every child and the way he progresses? Can I not uh, create a different content for every child? Not all children learn the same way. Some children learn visually, some children learn through examples. Can I not have the same teacher for all students? Can I create, use the web and the videos to actually match the learning style of the student with the teaching style of the, of the teacher? And finally, you know, it doesn't make sense for all the kids in the class to get exactly the same homework. It just doesn't make sense. The kids who are ahead need not do all these problems. They can just do three hard problems. Kids who are behind need to do more simple problems first and then the hard problem. So you can see that this one-size-fits-all system has really failed us because we are very curriculum-centric, not student-centric. We are homework-centric, not uh, you know, progress-centric. So now let me give you one little example on assessment. Now if you do assessment at the problem level, you are going to ask this question, what is the right answer? Give me A, B, C, D. Now when you do that, you can tell how well he scored. So our education, our testing system is scoring based. It is not based on insights. What we really want to know is why did he not do it right? And that information is lost in the current testing system. Now if a human tutor is sitting in front of a child, and watching the child solve these problems, he will know a lot more than just looking at the problem assessment. So, uh, so if we do step level assessment, that means if we can tell at which step the student forgot the option, at which step he's taking longer, at which step he's making a silly mistake, there's a lot more that we can learn in one session than, uh, uh, than just a problem level. So the idea is assessment has to be at this level and can teaching machines do it at that level? Can they actually watch the students solve the problem and then do an assessment? Uh, how will we use this assessment? So if you think about it, let's say there are two students. One of them is better in certain concepts. The other is better in certain concepts. It doesn't make sense to force them to learn the same concept uh, uh, next. We can actually predict which concept this student is going to do better on and which concept the other student is going to do better on. And if we can do that prediction well, we can literally create a different learning path for every student. And that would be an amazing idea for personalized education. So, uh, so we talked about different ideas. Let me give you a, uh, another perspective on education. So if you look at uh, the world of e-commerce today, and if you look at just Amazon, worldwide, Amazon sells 30 million orders per day. And you would think, yeah, this is a great big data problem. There's a lot of data being generated. 
But Amazon had to work for so many years to create the infrastructure to, uh, to, to get here, right? If you look at Google, the number of queries on Google per day is 3.5 billion. And it took 15, 20 years for Google to get to this stage. What about education? How much data are we generating in education? And can we use that data to improve education systems the way we have used this data to you know, improve our search engines? So let me do a simple math. If you calculate every step that every student solves in every problem, and you add that up across the world, we are actually going to get 100 billion steps per day, which is more than the number of searches that people do on Google. So this is an enormous big data problem. If you could capture all those steps, and we could mine them, and we could figure out what are the key difficulties different students have, and we can use that to actually customize education for every child, that would be a completely different paradigm uh, in going future. So let me summarize what the future of education is going to look like. It's going to be infinitely scalable. It's not going to be limited by the number of students per class and teacher-student ratios. It's going to be always available. It's not going to be 9 to 3 or whatever. It is going to be available anytime the child wants to learn. The system should be available to teach him. And finally, it's going to be highly personalized. It's going to be like a personal agent or a personal tutor to every child. So with that, let me just uh, close. So internet now is the new library. We don't go to the internet anymore, we go, uh, to the libraries anymore, we go to the internet. If you've seen, the emergence of this new age education has already started. The massive online courses are offered across the world. Uh, millions of students are enrolling for it and taking those. So these are the new classrooms. The classroom idea is not about a room and a teacher and a whiteboard. It's really about a video that millions of people can watch at their convenience. Infinitely scalable, infinitely available. Teaching machines are going to be the next tutors, if you will, the one-on-one -on -one tutoring that they will do. And finally, our tablets and our virtual reality systems are going to be the new schools. So with that vision, hopefully our grandchildren will study in a different school than what we did. Thank you.